Hello everyone, I'm Joe Palmetto, Joe the Lawyer. Today I want to talk about jury selection in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. Thank you everybody for tuning in. My name is attorney Joe Palmetto. If you like my content, please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Those are free ways to support the show. The show will always remain free, but go ahead, give me a subscribe, give me a like. It helps me in the YouTube algorithm. So I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with the Kyle Rittenhouse story, right? August 25th, 2020, uh, crazy year, <laughs> but uh, in the midst of the pandemic and after the, the George Floyd killing, uh, there were riots and unrest across the country. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, a then 17-year-old from Antioch, Illinois, shot and killed two people and wounded another during mon multiple confrontations. He claimed that he was in Kenosha uh, protecting businesses from the rioting. Okay, <clears throat> on Monday, jury selection begins in this case. I expect it to take about two weeks. Now, I told you I'm a practicing Pittsburgh attorney. Uh, just, just two days ago, I selected a jury. It took about four hours. Anywhere from two to four hours is the average time on let's say a, a a a less complicated type of case, right? The the jury that I was doing the jury that I chose was on a misdemeanor case, even some minor felonies. Okay, two to four hours. But in a big high profile case like this, we're looking at two to four weeks, and that is because the jury pool, the potential citizens who are going to sit on this jury in Wisconsin are already familiar with what happened, right? This Kyle Rittenhouse issue was blast, has been blasted for months over, it's been over a year, yeah, over a year now on national news, radio, and the internet. So what is jury selection exactly? What is jury selection? Let's start here, okay? The Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the rights of criminal defendants, including the right to a public trial without unnecessary delay, that has a deeper meaning, the right to a lawyer, and the right to an impartial jury, all right? There's more to it. Uh, the Sixth Amendment than that, but the right to an impartial jury. Well, what does impartial mean? That's a very deep question. It's been argued uh, about between uh, jurist attorneys for a very long time. Just to, just to give you a, a quick definition, I think you probably know what impartial means, but non-biased, a fair jury, a jury that comes in and sits down without preconceptions about whether a person is innocent or guilty. And, and that they can sit there without bias. For instance, sit there and look at a person who's accused of a crime of a certain race and not draw any negative or positive connotations from the fact of that person's race, uh, that person's gender, that person's background, perhaps, right? An impartial jury, 12 jurors who can sit there and set those things aside. So what is jury selection? Jury selection is the process, it's called voir dire, through which the attorneys and judge in the case talk to the potential jurors to make sure they don't come in with those preconceptions, to make sure that they are impartial and non-biased when they're sitting there so that they can hear the facts of the case in a, uh, let's say, an abstract bubble, right? You step into that courtroom as a juror. You are able, that, at that point in time, when you hear the testimony and you learn things there in that trial, then you can start to form your opinions based on the evidence, based on how the witnesses testified, their credibility, whether you believe they're lying or not, then that's when you can start to form an opinion. And in a way, you have to form a bias because you're going to make a decision about guilt or innocence at that point. But you, but coming in without preformed uh, opinions about guilt or innocence. In, in a case like this, it's extremely difficult. Again, the media has saturated the entire country with knowledge of this case, perhaps not as much as the George Floyd case, but the Kyle Rittenhouse, we can say that it's entered 
the, the national consciousness. Okay, before we go any further, many of you just come here, well, not to see me, not to hear the content, not to learn or have fun, but to take a sip with me. So let's do the same time sip. Today, I got some Dunkin' Donuts coffee. I'm already three quarters of the way through. Cheers with me. It tastes better when we sip together. Cheers. Mmm. Oh, delicious. It is a sort of... Uh, Outside today, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh, PA. It's, it's a kind of a perfect October day. And by that, I mean it's wet, it's rainy, and the skies are gray. <laughs> However, it's not too cold. So we'll take it. So that process called voir dire is going to allow the, jur- the, the attorneys, and every jurisdiction deals with it a little differently. Sometimes the lawyers don't have a direct role in asking questions of the jurors. Only the judge will do that, and the attorneys can submit questions that the judge asks. And then the judge does all of the questioning. Some, it's a mixture of the judge asks some questions, the lawyers ask some questions, and then some, it is just the lawyers who ask the questions, and a judge only gets involved if need be. The jury that I selected in my trial last week, uh, there was no judge involved. It was me and the other attorney. And we have to decide how we want to strike these jurors. Now, in each case, and again, I don't know all the details in um, in Wisconsin, Attorneys can strike jurors, they're called peremptory challenges, based on the answers to their questions, and they don't have to explain themselves. A peremptory challenge is a strike for with the, a, an attorney or party can make without explaining themselves. In a misdemeanor trial in Pennsylvania, you get five in a felony, you can get seven, and that can also change based on the circumstances. Now, the defense can strike that many, and so can the Commonwealth. So picture the scene, everyone's in the courtroom, the, the judge or the attorneys ask a series of questions to the juror, the juror gets up, walks away, and then the lawyers exercise their right to strike. Now, if a juror is obviously biased based on their answers, you can strike for cause, and neither the the prosecutor or the defense loses a strike. A cause strike is unlimited. That's why this jury will take two weeks to select, because there are going to be so many jurors who come in with these preconceived ideas that the judge is going to strike dozens, hundreds of them perhaps, for cause, because they're going to say, well, I saw this on the news. I can't be fair. For one reason or another, they could list all types of factors. Let me give you a quick example of some factors. Um, They may strike a juror, okay, because... uh, uh, like a ju- jurors can come in. In this case, they're going to say, I know the facts. But I had a juror who came in and said that she believed in in the prison abolition, that prisons and jails should not exist. Therefore, she's highly biased towards the defense, the people accused of the crimes, and she was struck for cause. Then we've had people who, have very unf- who believe that they were treated unfairly by the court system in perhaps their own cases. And due to that... Uh, they, they, you know, they might say, oh, the judge or the lawyers in the case did this to me, that to me. Okay. They can't sit there and be non-biased. So those are examples of strikes for cause. Okay. In this case, the, the questions are going to be around what they already know about the case and if they've already formed an opinion. So finding 12 people plus backup jurors who haven't formed an opinion about this case already is going to be difficult. Now, let's go into strategy. And, you know, this is just an article I found on the, the Wall Street Journal, Kyle Rittenhouse shooting trial to focus on reasonableness and self-defense. The defense in this case is going to say that Kyle Rittenhouse shot these people, but he was under attack. Okay, the prosecution is going to say, no, these people weren't under attack. He was out there being a vigilante. So how do I think the lines will be drawn? This is my opinion. And, you know, look, uh, these are just, this is just a cold, hard opinion. The world, uh, th- you know, there's there's the world as we wish it was and the, where, the world as it is, all right? And the world as it is, the Rittenhouse defense is going to be looking for gun owners. 
people who believe that individual citizens have the right to carry guns, use them in self-defense. The second part on my list there, Second Amendment advocates. That goes together, right? Gun owners, Second Amendment advocates, they believe that guns uh, should be in the hands of citizens who are responsible with them and can use them in self-defense, and they may see Kyle Rittenhouse in that light. Now, these individuals also tend to be conservative, so people of conservative background, uh, pro-police, pro-law enforcement pro sort of law and order type opinion okay and what 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 is the identity of these people that's going to fall on well most likely white males so that's that's probably what the Rittenhouse defense is going to be looking for now the prosecution gun control advocates they're going to paint Kyle Rittenhouse as a vigilante shouldn't have been out there with this gun acting the way that he was it was reckless and therefore dangerous therefore he should be found guilty of killing these people without a good reason. Those individuals tend to be liberals, tend to have an overall anti-police attitude. Uh, those individuals also tend to be uh, minorities as far as their identity concerned and or females. Now, the interesting thing when you're selecting a jury in a case, I'm going to use these examples here, is when you have a mixture of attributes, right? And, and, and these also make for, let's, let's be honest here, sometimes the most interesting people. So let's say you have a minority female who is also a Second Amendment advocate. Well, there's some attributes about the person that the prosecution likes. Well, they're minority, they're a female, okay? They may even be liberal in their political leanings, at least on most things, most things or many things, but they have pro-Second Amendment opinions, well, that's the kind of person that may end up on the jury because each side is going to see positive attributes. And if they answer the questions well, say that they can be non-biased, they probably have a large chance of being selected. Again, and on the opposite side of that coin, uh, you may have a white male um, who is a liberal, a white male, very pro-police attitude, okay? However, he is a lib he's liberal and maybe a gun control advocate. And so that type of person is, there's attributes of defense that likes about that person and the prosecution, and that individual may in fact end up on the jury. Now, a lot of people do think that jury selection is just about race, etc., etc., or the identities, but I put these other attributes at the top because they're actually going to be much more important. The person's opinion on guns and gun control and the use of force is going to override whatever those other attributes are. Race, gender, religious background, etc. These are more important. These are more important that person's opinions on these than what the person's identity is. And you're going to be able to ask them about their beliefs. So you get interesting mixes on juries. You, you know, people on the outside may see, you know, let's say an all white jury and say, oh, well, you know, they're going to be these conservatives that, that you know, that's pro, pro law enforcement. That that's probably not the case. Usually there's a good mix down the middle, just like you may get a full minority minority jury. And, uh, you know, they may sit on the jury and you say, well, uh, you know, they're going to be very biased one way or another. Again, it's not always the case. These jurors have been vetted. Now, sometimes you're left with no good options as an attorney, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, all the jurors you go through may have a, a single opinion and then you end up you end up with it being weighted one way or another. However, every juror that sits is going to have been vetted by both sides to one degree or another. And the hopes is that you get sort of an even mix. Six jurors maybe lean defense ideology. Six jurors lean prosecution ideology. And then they sit down in a fair way, hopefully, you hope. And if they come to their decision, okay, what the jury selection process does is it gives more legitimacy to the jury's decision because one side or the other can't say that they didn't have a role in selecting those people. That's one of the reasons 
I love the jury system in the United States, the Sixth Amendment right to a trial by jury. I think it is tremendously fair and it is certainly not perfect, nor is it always fair. Um, but I think it gives legitimacy to the decisions more so than a le than legitimacy of a decision that may come from a judge. I am a big pro uh, advocate for the jury selection system and process in the United States. So I expect this to take about two days. You know, remember with Wisconsin, Wisconsin, it, it's probably there's probably more white people there than there are minorities. So you're probably going to end up with a larger white person jury but you don't know the the uh, uh the george floyd one ended up coming down it was it was a fairly diverse jury so this jury I, may end up being more diverse than the overall population of wisconsin but still be a majority white jury panel okay we'll come back and talk about this after the jury selection i hope you enjoyed this episode of joe the lawyer if you like my content please like subscribe comment and share i hope you uh, uh learned something today uh adios cheers peace thank you from the great state the great state of pennsylvania in the city of pittsburgh pa thank you Bye bye